name is Ruben, um, and I am a machine learning researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, I'm going to talk about deep symbolic optimization, which is a framework uh, based on reinforcement learning uh, for combinatorial optimization that we developed at the lab. Um, this is based on work from a, a whole team uh, from which I want to highlight the PI, Brennan Peterson, and uh, Mikael Landajuela, uh, who have spent the most time on this project and are also responsible for some of the content of these slides. Um, yeah, so the content of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about what is our problem and how are we approaching it, uh, some underlying technologies, but we're not going into math or anything, just like simple examples. And then I'm giving some application examples for regression, uh, the classic um, reinforcement learning control policies, and then some real world examples as well. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so our work is concerned with discrete sequence optimization, and um, many machine learning problems fall into this category. So we, are, we want to optimize for a variable length sequence um, of discrete tokens where each element in the sequence is sampled uh, from a library of possible tokens. So most of the times we are only interested in the best performing um, sequence given a black box reward function. Um, so this is a, excuse me. Uh, there are a couple of examples uh, where you can imagine this. Uh, so for example, auto ML applications like neural network architecture search where the tokens represent uh, the architecture hyperparameters of a neural network, and the reward is uh, the validation accuracy. Uh, you can also imagine this for antibody design, where the library consists of proteins, and the reward is the uh, binding affinity. Um, and then we also have symbolic regression, uh, which I will use as an example in the following slides, uh, before I introduce other applications, where you have the library of mathematical operators, and the reward function is the mean squared error. Okay, but um, before describing the framework, I think it's important to understand that we can describe um, mathematical expressions as binary trees, where nodes represent mathematical operators and leaves are variables or constants. Um, on the other hand, uh, we can also represent these trees as a sequence and maintain a one-to-one -one correspondence between the trees, the expression, um, and the sequence. Um, the important takeaway here is that we can build sequential representations of any mathematical expression and use autoregressive sampling to generate new expressions. So, but how does this work? Um, I'll walk you through an example for a mathematical expression, and we start with the library of mathematical operators as tokens. So you can see we have these um, different color tokens. Um, they can be either binary, uh, which is green here, uh, which will spawn um, two child tokens in the tree that we generate. They can be unary, which are the red ones, and that spawn a single child token in the tree. And then we have the blue ones, which are the terminal tokens, which basically end the tree branch. Um, the core fr framework is a recurrent neural network uh, that takes as input the parent and the sibling of the next token we want to sample. The output of the recurrent neural network is a categorical distribution over all tokens in the library, providing a probability for each token to be sampled. We can add logical constraints or priors to the sampling that effectively reduces the number of possible sequences or just improves sampling. However, even so we are actively using this in all examples I will show. I won't be talking about it today for, for time reasons, but please check our papers for uh, more information if you're interested. Okay, uh, let's start by sampling the first node. Um, as we can see, this is a division token, which is a binary token, and extends the tree with two empty child nodes. The division token then becomes the parent token for the next sampling round, while the sibling remains empty because we don't know, because we haven't defined it yet. Um, the division token, oh sorry, um, we, we then move along um, the sequence, building the tree in a depth first and left to right manner. Um, and the recurrent neural network carries the information of the sequence uh, while we adapt the input according to the tree that is generated until all branches end in terminal, uh, terminal tokens. Um, the final tree then represents a mathematical expression built through autoregressive sampling. Mm. Okay, so 
on this side, I want to introduce a method that helped improved, improve our results a lot. And we call it risk-seeking policy gradient. Uh, but this is not only limited to symbolic regression or even discrete optimization or autoregressive frameworks. In fact, this, this, this risk-seeking policy gradient can be applied to any reinforcement learning task. The basic idea is that instead of using the average performance um, as a training signal, we're using the best case performance uh, in, yeah. And in practice, this looks like, like this here. We first sample a batch size number of sequences from the recurrent neural network at random. And you can see each tower represents a, a single sequence. Um, we then compute the rewards for each, each sequence. And then how, at this point, we are selecting only the best epsilon performing sequences um, according to our reward function and calculate the epsilon reward quantile. Um, we only use that filtered batch then uh, for the uh, training of the recurrent neural network. Um, so here in, in this animation, you can see the comparison between the vanilla policy gradient in red and the risk-seeking policy gradient in blue. You can also see the colored dots as the current average reward and the stars as the current best reward. It's easy to see that the risk-seeking approach uh, reaches the best score much faster than the vanilla policy gradient that slowly improves the average performance, generating more robust policies, but never reaching quite as high as the risk-seeking approach. Okay, now let's see some um, examples, and we start with a regression problem. So the goal of the sim symbolic regression is simple. Uh, given the data set of XY pairs, uh, we are we want to find a tractable mathematical expression that fits the data well. Um, this was our original problem, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, symbolic regression has a lot of benefits as a test bed uh, because there are already a lot of community vetted benchmarks, and there are many strong baselines available to compare progress. Our framework produces low order mathematical no um, models that can be readily interpreted, but last but not least, the reward calculation. Um, so in our case, the mean squared error is computationally not very expensive. Okay, like how, but how does this look like in, in action? So in this graph, you can see the red curve, which represents the product expression that we want to learn. And the blue dots are data, is, a, is a data set from which we learn, and that was sampled randomly from that expression. Okay, in this video, you are seeing the same amount of found expressions in every single frame drawn one over another. Initially, this looks a lot like chaos, but during training, you see that new expressions are much closer to the actual curve until the expression converge, and we eventually find an expression that satisfies our accuracy requirement. Okay, but, uh, but the symbolic approach uh, also has certain generalization benefits. For example, if the task is the prediction, uh, of a series of harmonic numbers, you can easily see that we can, we can fit a simple neural network here in orange um, to our training data, which is the red dots, um, as well as an expression found by optimization framework here in blue. However, if we start sampling data from outside our training data, uh, we quickly see that the error for the neural network increases the further we are away from our, from our training data, while the found expression continues to fit well for all numbers. In fact, our framework discovered in minutes what Leonard Euler discovered in the 18th century, and our framework was even able to recover the Euler's constant gamma with very high accuracy. So I'm not sure how long it took him, but I'm certain at least he would have preferred it from our framework. Okay, so now I'm going over to the classic reinforcement learning domain of learning control policies. And so currently, the state of the art for reinforcement learning are models that are parametric and complex, so neural networks. Um, and we want to see if we can build non parametric and simple models to solve uh, some standard benchmarks in reinforcement learning. Um, you can see our uh, framework in this figure. And the important parts are our policy generator on top, based on DSO, and the policy evaluator for the reward generation at the bottom. Um, and by the way, this work is different from the decision transformer that we've seen this morning, presented by Aravind, uh, who uh, um, generates sequences of actions while we generate whole policies and we then are not interested anymore in the um, generating framework. Um, so 
As we done these separate symbolic policies for each action dimension, we used a trick of an anchor policy. The anchor policy provides a pre done policy that we replace action dimension by action dimension uh, with a symbolic policy, which is then fixed during training until all action dimensions are replaced by symbolic policies. This pr produces significant smaller policies in terms of parameters and help to make the decision making more transparent, showing the important observations um, for each action dimension. Using the current policy at every step, we are generating Monte Carlo estimates of the expected return by playing a number of episodes and use then that as a trading signal for our policy generator. Um, applying this idea, we found highly performant symbolic policies for a variety of environments, as you can see in these small movies. So we often achieve comparable or improved performance on these standard reinforcement learning benchmarks while drastically reducing the complexity of the existing neural network models. As additional benefit, the symbolic form clearly shows the input parameters that are relevant for the control policy of each action while others are pruned away. We showed that in this way we can learn several complex tasks with multi-dimensional action spaces and we show this on this on the slide here uh, up to four dimensions here in the bipedal walker example. Okay, driven by the success of our more theoretic work, uh, we, we started to apply uh, our framework to more reward applications. Um, and I want to start with the uh, development of treatment schedule for sepsis. Uh, to date, there exists no FDA-approved uh, drug treatment or mot and mortality rates uh, for uh, sepsis without treatment are over 50%. And so you can show, you can see in the figure a pipeline that we develop um, to find such treatment schedules. Uh, first, we train a neural network uh, anchor policy that provides a dosage for a number of different medications. Uh, these are the, the colored dots. And we then fix uh, the ones that have little changes throughout the treatment, and then learn a symbolic policy for each relevant medication, similar to as what we've seen with the control policies before. Eventually, we remove the medications that have no high impact on the outcome and arrive at our sparse symbolic policy. Uh, neural networks can propose treatment that reduces the mortality rate to almost 10%. However, these policies can be deployed in clinical settings as the transparency and interpretability of the decision-making uh, process is not given. On the other side, our DSO policies only manage to get the mortality rate down to a little less than 30%, but we provide policies that can much easier be interpreted and might help to form actionable clinical insights. This is work in progress and we hope that we can get this number down much further in the future without losing the benefits of the DSO approach. Um, the second reward example is the design of power converted topologies. And this is just to show that our framework is not limited to mathematical functions um, as, we were, as we were used on the previous slides. In this case, our library consists of electronic components that we have to arrange uh, in, in a proper sequence to form an electric circuit. And then the sampling process produces the established tree structure as we've seen earlier. And then we can use this tree structure and translate it into an actual electrical circuit. And then we can use that circuit uh, and evaluate it in a surrogate model to get the efficiency of the converter and use that as a reward signal. Uh, and we, we can use then our uh, known risk-seeking policy gradient to train the topology generator until we find a a converter that satisfies our efficiency requirements. Um, okay, since uh, it's already time to wrap up, um, we have uh, a public-facing GitHub repository, so you can all download the software if you like. Um, we also provide uh, several interfaces. Uh, it's pip installable. Uh, we have command line scripts. Uh, you can use an sklearn-like interface, as you can see in the example box on the right or on the left. Um, and then we also provide a number of standard benchmarks, including our own results. And we are actively developing this, um, this repository as we um, push out new capabilities and, and new papers. OK, uh, to conclude, uh, I've shown that uh, DSO is a method for discrete sequence optimization using gradients. Um, I've introduced the risk-seeking policy gradient to maximize the best case behavior. Um, I've shown that we can apply this 
this technique to a, a number of very interesting domains. Um, and I want to say that we're currently working on, on integrating this into more real-world problems. You've already seen the first steps for the sepsis treatment, ele electronic circuit design, uh, but we're also starting with cancer treatment where we collaborate with the Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, the electronic circuit design has been picked up by an RPE project, um, and we're also starting to integrate this um, framework into the antibody design to uh, generate um, vaccine uh, vaccines for for uh, COVID or variants. Um, yeah, so this is a number of, of, of uh, papers that were used to put these slides together um, over the last year. Um, if you're interested, please read our work, cite us, and send us more questions if you have them. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.